you stop and think about this crew here. You know, I mean, we got some personalities. I'll tell you what. Um, today we're starting a new study, and I, and I think it will be a very interesting study. Uh, I'm going to call it Through a Mirror Darkly. Okay. Uh, you probably recognize that from uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. Uh, and in essence, what we're going to do is we're going to be studying uh, three chapters in 1 Corinthians that deals, uh, typically, you know, as you break it down, that section is often considered the problem of the Spirit's gifts. Very familiar uh, verse, a very familiar section. We go there for a lot, and sometimes we just take a little and leave a lot, Okay. And so we're going to be doing that uh, probably uh, for uh, a number of weeks. Uh, you know, just uh, I'm kind of open-ended on how long it's going to take because I've already learned from teaching this class before that it goes slower than you think, right? So, but by the way, the reason it goes slow is because we typically have some really great discussion uh, and observations. And so uh, I wanted to start today... Um, just with something of an overview of 1 Corinthians, okay? So if you would, we want to look at the 30,000 foot view, all right? And uh, kind of just get a little bit of orientation, kind of, uh, you know, recognize where we are in relationship to the book, what we've heard, what we know, what stands out to us as we think about the book of 1 Corinthians, and so, let's just kind of start with a very general, hey, what do we know about the, the church in Corinthians? It was a mess. It was a mess, yes. Okay, that's a, that's, that's a very technical approach to it, okay? You know, the church in 1 Corinthians was a mess. You know, and it's kind of funny because uh, a lot of times when we talk about, you know, hey, we want to be like the church in the New Testament, then we quickly fall out with everyone except the church in Corinth, right? And the funny part is, in some respects, uh, we, we really kind of reflect, uh, reflect the Corinthian church in, in, in some respects. We'll, we'll talk about that as we go along. Uh, so we know it's a mess. What else do we know? What, uh, whether, I'll, I'll put it this way. In 1 Corinthians, what verses really stand out to you? Now, what are the highlights of 1 Corinthians in your mind? 13, chapter 13. Chapter 13, absolutely. We're going to, as a matter of fact, I kind of had my Bible open to that. I was going to just read a few verses out of that. But that's known as the love chapter, okay? And so that is a very significant reading. And by the way, that love chapter is planted squarely in the middle of of the section we're going to be studying. So as we talk about uh, the problem of the gifts of the Spirit, you know, one of the interesting aspects of it, and the love chapter is smack dab in the middle of it, okay? So you got chapter 12, which kind of lays out the problem, chapter 13, and then chapter 14, you have his practical solutions to what's bothering them there and, and how they're acting and how they need to correct uh, their way of behaving when it comes to exercising their spiritual gifts. What else? 1 Corinthians 9, 22, uh, Paul says, I have become all things to all men, so that by uh, all possible means I may save some. Okay. That's an awesome verse. In fact, you're going to see that on my slide today because I picked that up as one of the key verses, one of the key takeaways uh, as far as how we understand uh, Scripture, what our attitude should be uh, as we relate to one another. By the way, that comes from the section known as the problem of Christian liberty. Okay? So, uh, let me just throw the, um, the outline up here because I know you guys are waiting you know, for the outline, a uh, you know, bated breath and you know, just on pins and needles. But... Uh, Here's the outline of 1 Corinthians, and you'll notice that each one of them more or less has something in common. Yeah, it's a problem, okay? And so the point is, is that Paul uh, went through the, the area of Corinth, and 
and uh, you read about the, the beginning of the church there in Acts chapter 18, all right? And uh, the church was well begun there, but let me just tell you a little bit about Corinth to begin with. You know, I don't know that many of us realize that Corinth was obliterated a hundred years before the time of this riot. It had kind of led a revolt against Rome, and the Roman says, well, forget you. And so they just sent, you know, a couple of legions over there, and they sacked and destroyed Corinth. And it basically was in ruins for about a hundred years when uh, Caesar decided, okay, we're going to rebuild it, and we're going to make it a Roman colony, and it became, if you would, the seat of government for that particular area. And the thing about Corinth, and the reason why it was such a, a, an important city, is that in, in terms of the seaways, okay, so the, you know, the coming and going of commercial v, uh, ships, and just, it was kind of like right there in the hub of the east-west traffic, all right, if you're going by sea. And it was also, you know, a, a, a main uh, city on the thoroughfare on the road system going north and south. And so for this reason, it was a very important commercial center. And so anytime you say commercial center, think money, think important, okay? So that's kind of how that rolls to this very day, right? And so, you know, uh, then um, there is, uh, interestingly, a thing about Corinth. What Corinth was kind of like the Las Vegas of the ancient world, okay? Meaning that, you know, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. I mean, it was known as, if you would, sin city of its day. And so a very, you know, carnal, very, you know, uh, uh, sin-filled city. And by the way, you see that in the letters as Paul is talking to them, as Paul is writing to them, basically encouraging them to, to you know, uh, not yield to the temptations, if you would, that were all around them, okay, in Corinth. And so they actually uh, created a verb, you know, that basically means to act like they act in Corinth. Mm. Which means, you know, very sensual, very, you know, so on and so forth. And so it was, it was a tough city to be preaching the gospel in because of the actual character of the city itself. All right, so let's check out the outline. Okay, uh, the problem of factions. All right, the problem of factions. You know... Uh, we were talking. I was talking earlier. How you know, we always want to say we want to be. You know. You know. We want to align ourselves. We want to identify ourselves with uh, the early church, except for that Corinthian church. <coughs> but you notice right off the bat, we kind of you know take a, a, a gut punch here, right? Uh, in the sense of, and still we are struggling with the problem of factions. All right. And so that's uh, that's one of the uh, one of the key. By the way, just for you to notice, uh, I put some of these uh, problems, some of the outline in blue, and the others are in black. I put the blue ones in there because these are kind of major issues, if you would. These are multiple chapter issues that Paul is dealing with, and some of the other ones. You know, our issues and obviously, you know, bones of contention within the church there. So Paul is addressing it. But you may notice some of them may only have 17 verses. Okay. So some of them are kind of, you know, hit it and, you know, address it and move on. And some of these things Paul spends up to, you know, three and four chapters dealing with. And interestingly, the longest ones have to do with factions and uh, Christian freedom. Okay? Guess what we struggle with today? Factions and Christian freedoms. And by the way, and the next largest one 
are in the, are in the same you know, category, three chapters, is the problem of the Spirit's gifts. And so Paul, if you would, pumps the brakes here and really slows down and kind of, you know, addresses those things in a lot of detail because he has to lay down, you know, uh, kind of the basic assumption, what we need to understand. Here's the purpose. So he's going to, you know, identify the problem, identify, if you would, the, the determining factors, the defining realities of that, and then he's going to actually address how then, you know, to respond to that situation in a godly fashion. And so, uh, the problem of the resurrection is just one chapter, but the fact that, you know, some there were questioning the resurrection, well, that's always a major thing, because Paul's going to say there in 1 Corinthians 15, is that if we do not, you know, if Christ is not raised, then, you know, basically we're undone, okay? Everything that we have believed, everything that we have taught, Basically, it's a very big nothing, and uh, frankly, we of all people are to be pitied because we have believed in a lie. All right. So, uh, the problem of factions, the problem of judgments, the problem of marriage, the problem of Christian freedom, the problem of proper spheres. Okay, it has to do with uh, authority and various other aspects. The problem of the love feast. All right, a lot of times we have read that section somewhat casually, okay, and thought that the issue here is the Lord's Supper, okay? Uh, it talks about the Lord's Supper, but uh, actually the issue is how they are behaving when they come together in a fellowship meal. And now this is bleeding over into you know, how we partake the Lord's Supper and what our attitude is at the time that we take the Lord's Supper. And so you know, the, the fellowship mills have, have corrupted and, and are creating problems that we can't even take the Lord's Supper with a proper spirit. Okay, All right, the problem of the Spirit's gift, which is actually uh, where we're going to spend all of our time. All right. The problem of the resurrection, the problem of the Judean collection, okay, and then the conclusion, all right? And so those are the, uh, that's more or less the outline of 1 Corinthians. Uh, I want to kind of share a couple of key verses out of some of the key sections, okay? And so this is on the problem of factions. So this is the first four chapters. I mean, just stop to think about that. And by the way, what Paul says in this uh, section, there is just a ton of red meat here in these four chapters. I mean, oh my goodness, it's just awesome. I mean, we could easily spend time just studying this section. We probably should. Okay, but uh, maybe you'll recognize this. Start... In chapter 1, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly joined in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared unto me of you, by uh, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that you, there are contentions among you. Uh, now this I say, that each, every one of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. And so, he asked, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And of course the answers are all, of course not. And that is the beginning of his uh, discourse on the irrational behavior of those who would be followers of men instead of followers of Christ. Next key verse in this section, or another key verse I should say, is in chapter 3. And I think this is so interesting because it really just kind of lays out there uh, the true condition of folks who would traffic in division. Uh, he says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit or spiritual people. 
but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? The idea being, you're not living up to your calling. Okay, you're acting like, you know, acting like just common people. You're acting like you have no understanding of, of the gospel of Christ and what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. And so you're acting, if you would, out of the flesh instead of acting and living in and through the Spirit and His influence. And so, as you can see, and by the way, later on in chapter 3, he's going to say some serious stuff, okay, about uh, the condition of those who play politics within the church, okay? So, uh, you know, we're not going to be doing this one, even though, you know, there's a lot to be discussed there. All right, next one, the problem of judgments. So this is skipping forward to chapter 5 and chapter 6. And uh, do you know what the two issues with judgment are? There's two issues. Which, I mean, when you kind of get down to it, I'm kind of stepping outside of the verses as such, but... You know, when you stop and think about judgment, there are two issues with it. All right? The first is the lack of judgment, and the other is the excess of judgment. Now, you, now you have, now that's kind of funny when you stop and think about it. Okay? And you stop and think about it, and that's exactly true today. Okay? Sometimes we exercise no judgment. And frankly, this verse is going, or this section is going to say, and I'll show it to you in the next verse, next slide. He says, look, you're going to judge the world. Can't you deal with these issues going on between brothers? I think you can do that. You know, we often default to that mm -hmm. statement of Christ, judge not lest you be judged. And so we, we can't judge people. You know, oh no, wait, it's, not our, it's not our job to judge people. That's not what he's saying here. He said, look, you're going to judge the world. You know, maybe you should start exercising. Maybe you need to start uh, sharpening that sword by exercising righteous judgment here and now. And so the point is, one of the big issues is the lack of judgment. All right, which, by the way, in our society today, is a big temptation, right? I mean, we have a very diverse society, you know, and, and you know, hey, what's right for me is right for me. What's right for you is right for you. I have my truth, you have your truth. And it's easy to buy into that and default to a position where as Christians we exercise no judgment. That's probably the wrong reaction. Okay? And then the next, uh, the next one is excessive judgment. And so, you know, not only are we going to exercise judgment, but we are going to, you know, turn a critical eye upon every brother in every situation, in every decision, every leader, every, you know, whatever's going on, we are going to be judging it all. We're going to be, you know, perhaps uh, dividing the body based upon, you know, individual convictions. And so I judge you because your conclusion on this topic is not the same as my conclusion. Instead of allowing, you know, a, a space for the, for the grace of God in your life and the work of God in your life to lead you to one place, whereas it leads me in another place according to where I am and my walk with God, where you are with your walk in God, okay? Instead of allowing for that and allowing God to, to accomplish what He's going to accomplish in some brother's life in God's time, 
we're basically saying, you know, I really need for you to be where I am, and I need for you to be there now. Otherwise, I don't have much use for you. And we've done that a lot of times. Okay? And so, interestingly, you know, you've got two extremes, right? The total lack of judgment. Hey, who am I to say what's right for you? All right? Or excessive judgment, which we're just, you know, multiplying and, and you know, we have no sense of, of balance. We have no sense of propriety. Or, you know, we're not even deciding what we need to do. It'll take the cord. You almost tripped over the cord. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Key verse. Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? And so these misunderstandings, you know, this brother who feels like he's been wrong, that brother who feels like he's been wrong, and, and you know, and of course, if you're familiar with this text, they're actually taking each other to court. And Paul says, wouldn't it be better just to be wrong than to go to the heathen and, and if you would, air the dirty laundry right there in front of the heathen. It's better to be wrong than to do that. Uh, again, in chapter 6, do you not know that we will judge angels? Okay. How much more the things of this life? Okay. And so, yes? Are we getting, are we getting later, are we going to get into that in depth of what that means? The judging the world? Because I personally don't understand it very well. Okay. Um, actually, no. <laughs> I'm just giving an overview, and then we're going to just, you know, part on the gifts of the, or the problem of the Spirit's gifts. But, since you bring that up. We can talk at home. Yeah, we can talk at home, or, or you know, uh, I'm thinking maybe after this we may come back and, and pick up another section. And uh, we can consider that. Okay, I've got, I've got thumbs up on that as well, okay? By the way, in, in all full disclosure, 1 Corinthians is one of my favorite books to teach. And so, uh, you know, after Romans. Uh, and, uh, and it's odd that it would be that way because over here you have Romans and he's laying out, if you would, the philosophy of the Christian faith. And then the next one, and here's all the problems that are happening as we're trying to live that calling out on a day-to-day -day basis. So maybe that's a good one-two punch, you know. Here's the ideal, and don't fall into these traps, right? I just feel like, like, the, like the Corinthians, uh, we still today have an issue with those two things, either lack of judgment or excessive judgment, or just not knowing exactly what God meant when he said, you will judge the world. Yep, yep. Well, you know, I mean, just to give you a little bit of headline, you remember uh, when Jesus says that Tyre and Sidon will judge you, speaking of the Jews? Okay. And so he's basically saying, you know what, there, you know, there is not this degree of disbelief in Tyre and Sidon, basically Gentile, even, you know, uh, cities. And he says, you know, your unbelief is so great in virtue of the revelation you received that frankly, people who have no understanding, no learning, don't have it this messed up. Okay? If I can put it in plain language. Even they don't have it this messed up. And yet you, with all of that privilege, you know, have gotten to this place. So anyhow. All right. Uh, when it comes to liberty, uh, key verses. Uh, one of my favorites, all right? Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. And so, if you would, a very, I mean, this is the beginning of the discussion that is going to have on Christian liberty. And the first shot out of the gun is this. Knowledge puffs up. Guess what? These folks were puffed up. 
Uh, they, they had kind of, you know, defined their turf. They, you know, they claimed their turf. They're ready to fight over that turf because they knew what they knew. Okay. Paul's opening gambit was, you know, knowledge is not necessarily the end all. Uh, love, if you would, trumps knowledge. And so love builds up. There, there is more than knowledge to be uh, involved or to be considered as we relate to one another. And then here's the verse that Bob was talking about, one of my favorites, right? Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jew, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, although I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. And to those not having the law, I became uh, one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am <coughs> under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. Very powerful statement uh, in terms of what our ethic should be in this world, and, and, and you know who needs to adapt to whom. Okay, when it comes to reaching out into our community. Okay, and so it is, you know, incumbent upon us to adapt to, if you would, the target market. Okay, the church is an institution that exists not for its own benefit, but it exists to benefit those who do not belong to the church. Okay, and so we adapt to them, not speaking of compromising truth or compromising morals or anything like that, but sometimes we just insist on our things, our ways all the time to the point that we just, you know, if you would magnify the distance and build a wall between us and those that we are sent here to reach. Paul had a totally different mentality. You know? Hey, to the Jew, I'm going to act like a Jew to reach the Jews. To the Gentiles, I'm going to act like a Gentile to reach them. To the weak, I'm going to be weak. To the strong, I'm going to be strong. Look, I'm going to be all things to all men so that by all means, some might be saved. I like the three alls because I think it really identifies uh, what our attitude should be. When he says all things to all men so that by all means some might be saved. He's given us, if you would, the broadest latitude possible to identify with, to engage the world around us for Christ. Okay? And sometimes, you know, we're going to make that window so small that if you're not, you know, at this certain time, at this certain place, with this certain mentality, if you don't see it the way we see it, if you don't believe it the way we believe it, if you don't, if our issues are not your issues, and if your response to those issues aren't our responses to those issues, then we have no use for you. Okay? And uh, that just kind of flies in the face of a mentality that seeks to build the bridge instead of build the walls to the world around us. Okay. So, uh, as we turn to uh, our particular section here. So this is chapters 12, 13, and 14. As we read it, uh, what we're going to see is that... Uh, there are uh, various problems that we can identify from what Paul has written down. And so, uh, by the way, I forgot to say here, let me see, I have that down here someplace. 
what Paul had to say about the Corinthians. I mean, we shouldn't think that everything in Corinth was, you know, was bad news. Let me put my glasses on. Almost, almost get this. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you would, just kind of read there with me. Starting in verse 2, he does his, uh, his greeting. And in verse 2, he says, To the church of God in Corinth. You know, kind of as jacked up as you are. But to the church of God in Corinth. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what he says now in verse 4. He says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Okay, and so he is acknowledging that they have received, you know, uh, a measure of grace. Maybe even, you know, as you look at what he's about to say, maybe even a measure of grace that, you know, outstrips other churches in that time, okay, in that area, in that time. Because he says, for in him you have been enriched in every way. And so the church in Corinth, you know, has received a measure of grace that, you know, kind of basically leaves them enriched. And so he says, in all of your speaking, in all of your knowledge, because uh, our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack in any spiritual gift. And so the Lord has been very gracious. He has given them, you know, a working of the Spirit and, and gifts that perhaps rival any other church, maybe even exceed other churches, as He says, you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. And He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which, I mean, when you stop and think about it, Paul sets the tone for the way that we should behave towards others. Mm -hmm. he, he tells them all of their good points before he gets on to them. Yeah. Well, you know, among other things, he's also, by reminding them of their calling, all right, and the grace they received, he basically is going to, you know, ask them to live up to the calling and to the grace. I mean, if you have been blessed over and beyond what others have received from God, and that is acknowledged, then certainly, you know, if you would, I am required to act in a way that corresponds to the blessing I have received. You know? And that's what Paul is basically doing here. But what I wanted you to see is that Corinth had some good things going on here. All right, Corinth, you know, was was you know almost blessed beyond measure when compared to other churches, and you know, in in essence, he's also kind of, you know, very early, uh, perhaps identifying things that are very important to them, because he says, look, you don't lack anything when it comes to knowledge and to the gifting. But then he's going to come along and say, you know what? But knowledge and gifting isn't everything. Okay? And so, okay, let's acknowledge what there is. Let's acknowledge the blessing. I want to encourage you, number one, to live up to that calling. And B, let's put all of that in a context that makes it work for everyone, which, as we'll see, is a context of love. All right. So, getting back to... Uh, chapters 11, uh, 12, 13, and then 14. As you read that section, what you're going to find is that several issues are very evident. What's going on there? Okay? And again, part of the, the secret sauce anytime you're, you're interpreting mm -hmm. the Bible is to understand what the circumstance is that he is addressing. Okay? And so we can do that as we read the verse. So here we go. First off, 
there's a lot of contradiction going on. People saying they speak for the Spirit of God are saying the exact opposite things. So that's where he starts in chapter 12. Okay? Uh, there is division. And so the division that ultimately, if you would, started, you know, based upon these different personalities who played significant roles in, in the life of that church, all right, well, that division, which, if, if you would, they, they accepted and that they, you know, uh, uh, practiced over individuals ultimately showed up again, all right, when it came to the questions of the Spirit's gifts. And so, as it turns out, the Spirit's gifts are one more thing for us to divide over. Which, oddly enough, is just the opposite of the desired effect. And that's where he starts talking about the body in chapter 12. Alright? The pride issues. The self-centered issues. Because these people took their spiritual gifts... And they assumed that they received that because they were special. Because they were better than other people. And they wanted to take those spiritual gifts and they wanted to use them for their own edification. And so this is what makes me special. This is why I need to be heard. Okay? And so uh, they were self-centered. And then we get to exclusivity. Which basically, you know, people were saying, well, you know, we have these guys over here that have this gift, and we really don't need you guys over there who have a lesser gift, and we don't need the ungifted at all. Okay? And so now we're assigning, you know, specific values to specific gifts, and people were thinking, you know, because you are ungifted or because you have one of these less honorable, less important gifts, you know, we really don't have any need of you. And so they were being exclusive. Goes again back to ego, goes back to pride, goes back to division, right? So, so it's kind of like this little perfect storm, uh, as, it, as it were. Ego, talked about that, disdain for the ungifted. Okay? Well, you know, if you were gifted, you were up here. If you did not, have, if you had not received one of the Spirit's manifestations, then you are down here. And so, hey, you know, there we are. That exclusivity showing its face again. And so Paul's going to address that right off the bat, okay? Very important. And then a disregard for the body. And this goes back to what does it mean to be a member of the body? Why did he choose that illustration? That, you know, hey, the, 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 the church is the body of Christ. He chooses that for a reason. Okay? It brings something to the table. Something that all the other images will not, you know, establish. And he brings that because it speaks right to the understanding that they are lacking as to why God gave these gifts in the first place. Okay? And so, uh, you know, as we uh, begin our study, I think it's interesting to understand the challenges that we will face. Okay? Because uh, the, this particular three chapters is very controversial. It's controversial because of um, religious movements that are now well established in theological, you know, traditions that are now well established that affect how we read the chapter. Okay, and so uh, we typically, you know, read the chapter based upon our reality versus reading the chapter based upon the reality of that church to whom he was writing and understanding what is being said in virtue of their situation. Okay? 
it changes how we read uh, the, the text. And so if we're approaching it from a contemporary standpoint, okay, well, you know, since the early 1900s, we have the, the uh, charismatic movement, and you have the Pentecostal movement, which, you know, typically are synonymous, but not totally synonymous. But the idea is, is that they, you know, talk about the, the gifts of the Spirit, and they talk about the, the different powers and such as that. And so, um, by the way, that's a good discussion to have. I think our avoidance of the topic did not serve us well. You know, that was maybe something we didn't really, that discussion we didn't care to have. Because that wasn't the way we were raised. That was one of our, if you would, red flag issues. We were very uncomfortable with that discussion. But by avoiding it, we actually... Uh, you know, I think uh, limited ourselves and limited uh, the kingdom of God. And so, the uh, two terms that I would read it, uh, that I would I would uh, introduce to you is exegesis and eisegesis. Someone says, "Okay, that means nothing to me." Exegesis means we read from the text. We draw from the text. Okay? And we are, are discovering what is there. Eisegesis means we're reading into the text. Okay? And so, basically, as we start with a contemporary reading, we are more likely to read into the text. Realities, controversies, issues, questions, Traditions, biases that have come along in the last hundred years, maybe 150 years. And so we're responding to what our society today and what the religious world today thinks and knows about that topic. That's eisegesis. We're reading into it. We are adapting the text to our reality. You know, that ideally is not what we want to do because as it turns out, when we're reading into it, our biases, our fears, uh, and uh, our traditions. Whereas as we approach the text, and we're going to do a little exegesis, that means we're drawing from the text. We're just looking at the text, seeking to understand what issues were the issues being addressed and that is the scope of our study. All right. By doing that, we're going to come away with a better conclusion. So we want to reach a valid conclusion, and we do that not by reading it through a contemporary prism, but by understanding uh, what the situation was in Corinth that Paul was addressing. So we will stop there for today. This was kind of an introduction. And so, if I left you more confused than when you got here, you know, do not fear. Uh, this was just the beginning. This is important.